Shakespeare's greatness is a function part of his universality. That is what he has to say about human nature and human beings that's deepest and most universal is great. Um, and so he causes us to experience meaning that's very deep. He draws for that on universal ideas and universal truths about human beings. And he combines that with various literary tradition and the very particular specific details of his time. Between the specific and particular details of his time, which really are no longer relevant to us, and those great universals, which are relevant to us, there are, lie a whole lot of unexamined assumptions about the nature of the world. They're received, they're shared by everyone at the time, they're assumed, just as we in our time assume ideas and share them with everybody. But the ideas are different. So between the particulars that don't matter and the universals that do to everybody, there are these important ideas that are important to the people of the time, but they may change in our time. For example, Shakespeare's view of the world was hierarchical. Um, there was a top and there was a bottom and everybody had a place on the great chain of being. Our idea of the universe is egalitarian, both in natural terms, Darwin, and in political terms. We don't think in terms of hierarchy, we think in terms of equality. Another difference, after Freud, we tend to think that everything that is deep and passionate about us is rooted in our sexuality. Freud locates all powerful ideas and thoughts and emotions in sexuality somewhere. Um, Shakespeare inherited an idea from the Greeks of four different kinds of love. And they, they uh, could overlap in any one person's experience, but they weren't the same thing. And they weren't all rooted in sex. Another one, some people believe nowadays that everybody and all motivation is essentially selfish. <clears throat> and uh, the good people are just being selfish in their way and so on. Um, as opposed to the more traditional idea of the possibility of there being such a thing as virtue. Uh, Edelstein, who's the new artistic director at the Globe, out of this modern sensibility, thinks of Antonio and Bassanio as gay lovers, disappointed gay lovers, or one of them is anyway, because it's so uh, topical and applicable to our time. You can't imagine doing it any other way. But Shakespeare believes in the ideal of true friendship. And in the biblical idea, greater, hath, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's from the King James. Shakespeare would have known it in the Geneva Bible. So our time is characterized by these ideas of race and class and gender. There are cliches. They're based on reality, some kinds of realities and on a development or change in some value, some, some good, some not good. You can shut down any argument now by accusing someone of racism or sexism or homophobia or being wealthy or the like. But our self-congratulation for addressing these issues when applied as a screen to the interpretation of Shakespeare clouds that in him which is universal. So only our own concerns, our temporary concerns, come up for us and not the broader and deeper ideas. So what I want to say tonight about this play is Shakespeare provides everything necessary to his audience's understanding. The problem for us is our difficulty in receiving 400 years later what he has given. The mistaken notion that, as Philip Thompson wrote, Shakespeare should have been celebrating modern sympathies has bequeathed to us a long list of misleading critical questions about The Merchant of Venice. Here are five of them. I'm going to number them so you can follow me. Number one, why is Antonio sad? The first line of the play, in sooth, I know not why I'm so sad. Shakespeare clearly makes an issue of his sadness. And by the way, sadness here doesn't just mean unhappiness. It means sobriety soberness, seriousness. Shakespeare makes an issue of his sadness in Act 1, Scene 1, but nowhere is it explained. Does Antonio really not know what is making him sad? If he knows, why does he not say what it is? If he does not know, what is he hiding from himself? These are modern questions, mind you. 
In any case, what is the cause of his sadness? Is it the ships? Is he jealous of Bassanio's quest for Portia because he is secretly in love with Bassanio himself? Does Antonio feel guilty about something? Anti-Semitism, perhaps? What is wrong with him? Question set two. What is wrong with Bassanio? If Bassanio were really an ideal lover and friend, how could he, for the sake of material and matrimonial gain, let his friend come to be beholden to the hostile Shylock? Bassanio seems to have been a spendthrift, but Portia and Antonio say they love him. Do they love him in spite of his faults, or does he grow up in the play and learn something? If so, why does he give away Portia's ring? Is Shylock, this is three, part three, is Shylock not justified in being angry and vengeful? After all, we know how the Jews have been persecuted, and Shylock accuses Antonio of spurning and spitting on him. Even Antonio admits that he's likely to do so again. Isn't Antonio's contempt for the Jew as bad as Shylock's hatred of the Christians? Aren't Shylock's motives in wanting to punish Antonio understandable after Jessica absconds with her father's money? And isn't Shylock's hath not a Jew eyes speech not only rhetorically compelling, but also just? Jews do have eyes and ears like their Christian brothers, so how can we fault Shylock for demanding equality? Isn't the trial scene therefore an example of Christian hypocrisy? Who are these Christians to get on their high moral horse and prevent the wrong Shylock from exacting the penalty due from Antonio under the law when they themselves, as Shylock says, hold slaves? And can there be a clearer instance of their injustice than forcing a man to give up his religion for theirs? Isn't Shakespeare showing that if Shylock is bad, it is the evil of the Christians that has made him so? Four, how can Jessica be justified in betraying and robbing her own father and abandoning her heritage? Can her running off with Lorenzo be anything but faithlessness and disobedience, confirmed by her disguise and by the list of unfaithful lovers to whom she and Lorenzo compare one another in Act Five? And five, how can Portia be an ideal figure when she makes Italo-centric fun of her suitors and expresses racist prejudice against Moors in her comments on Morocco's complexion? Why does she obey her father, her dead father's stipulations about finding a husband instead of just marrying Bassanio if she loves him? Isn't the casket test unfair since it does not consult her feelings? And she seems to cheat by playing a song for Bassanio to give away the secret of the caskets. In the court scene, she invites Shylock to be merciful, but before he has a chance to show mercy, she suggests that even if he is not merciful, he will win the case. Doesn't this prejudice him against mercy? Why isn't her legalistic quibble about blood just as self-serving as Shylock's demand for the pound of flesh? After the trial, she forces Bassanio to break his oath to her by giving up the ring so that later she may tease him. Isn't her mercy speech a hypocritical smokescreen for a very unjust young lady? These are the disintegrating questions that have bedeviled this great play for 200 years. But they are our questions, not Shakespeare's. And trying to answer them in our own terms only leads us further from the universal insights that if seen on its own terms, the play illuminates for us. When we remember that Shakespeare's play is meant to be not a modern slice of life or realism in our sense, but Renaissance poetic drama, all these prob problems disappear like images in a funhouse mirror when one steps outside. <clears throat> in Shakespeare's terms, the play is about true and false valuation, about knowing what is good to do and then doing it, about seeing true value behind false shows. This is why the casket scenes are so prominent, why Portia and Nerissa and Jessica dress up as men, why Shylock and Antonio are in conflict. Shylock misvalues everything in keeping with Shakespeare's received and affirmed ideas about the spiritual blindness of holding to the old Judaic dispensation in the, friend, in the face of the new Christian gospel of love. To Shylock, quantity is all, and quality, being invisible, is non-existent. Daughters are exactly like ducats lost. A Jew is like other men in having eyes and ears, in being poisonable, in having a right to revenge. Possession, material, self-concern, the letter of the law, and revenge 
are the only language Shylock knows. Antonio stands for quality at the cost of any quantity, including quantity of life. His language is that of gift, affection, concern for others, the spirit of the law, and self-sacrifice. He is a good Christian not in preaching the doctrine of love, but in embodying it. He and Bassanio, whose true minds are married, symbolically represent the higher values in their respective arenas. As Antonio stands for self-sacrifice in the world of Venice, which is governed by commerce, fortune, action, law courts, and the acquisition of wealth, so Bassanio stands for the same in the world of Belmont, which is governed by love, matrimony, music, casket tests, and the enjoyment of wealth. Bassanio is willing in Belmont to give and hazard all he hath for Portia, as Antonio is for him in Venice. Everyone in the play is called to discern true value in situations where it may be disguised. And what is true value? In the law court, it lies not in the letter of the law, but in justice seasoned with mercy. In the winning of the lady, it lies not in the outward show, not in the possession of the desired object or the assumption of desert, but in willing self-sacrifice. In the household of Shylock, it lies in escape, away from possessiveness, materialism, and soulless obligations, and toward Christian love and joy, represented by marriage and by music. Launcelot desires to leave Shylock's service against his conscience. In this, his will is right, his reason wrong. For his conscience is a golden casket containing a devil, and his supposed fiend is a leaden casket containing his true conscience. And his actual choice reveals the truth about Bassanio's liberality. Bassanio is not a spendthrift, but a bestower of gifts. Shylock lives in a miserly fashion, not merely keeping within his means, but always seeking to acquire more than he needs and grudging every expense down to the food of his servants. By contrast, Bassanio spends money on liveries for his servants and on entertainment for his friends, showing generosity and taking joy in the sharing of his substance, as Antonio takes joy in giving to Bassanio what he needs and as Portia takes joy in giving to both. In Lorenzo's speech about the spheres in the last act, the play makes explicit the philosophical ground of all the challenges to proper evaluation. This is Act 5, Scene 1. Look how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patterns of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdst, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubins. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. Enclosed in flesh, we cannot see the soul it encloses or hear the music of the spheres. But we may know they are there and value both above what we see and hear. Portia has expressed the need for the seasoning of justice. Earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. And without its seasoning, none of us should see salvation. In every character and in every arena, the ability to season judgment is likewise challenged. The betrayal of one's father by escape is wrong unless it is seasoned with true motives and fidelity to a higher value. Bassanio's desire for Portia is seasoned with wisdom, no mere fancy bred in the eye where it must soon die. And in the giving of the rings, oaths and symbols are seasoned with understanding and forgiveness. Oaths and bonds must be adhered to or justice would collapse. But to the higher values of forgiveness, mercy and faithful love, the bonds of the heart, they must give way. Having been put in good order, Venice is left behind for Belmont. So the whole play is of a piece, a variety of dances to a single theme ending in one of the loveliest scenes of harmony in Shakespeare. Only misvaluers will see the outward show of quarreling over the rings as a sign of trouble. The mock quarrels season love with mirth and point by contrasting with it to the generous love 
that underlies them. Seeing the play in this way, the only way that makes a unity of it, we may now look to the questions raised above and try to put them to rest. <clears throat> First, Antonio. Antonio has no secrets. Shakespeare shows us Antonio trying to understand why he is sad and failing to do so. But the speech in which Antonio questions his own sadness is not intended to make us guess at or assume a cause that Antonio cannot discover. If there were such a cause, how would we know what it was unless Shakespeare contrived to convey it to us explicitly one way or another? As Hamlet says, the players cannot keep counsel, they'll tell all. This is simply true of Shakespeare's drama. There is no time in the theater, as there is in the study, to invent underlying meanings for ourselves. Shakespeare keeps no secrets from his audience. He tells us explicitly what he wants us to know, and more than once. What does he want us to know in this case? Simply that Antonio is sad without knowing why. This is the simplest of premonition and foreshadowing. It is consistent with the normal degree of Shakespearean realism because Shakespeare's audience certainly believed in premonitions, at least for the purposes of drama. Desdemona sings Willow, Hamlet says, oh my prophetic soul, and how ill all's here about my heart, Clarence dreams of drowning, and so on. Here Antonio is feeling as premonition what he is soon to feel as reality. And Shakespeare means us to sense the sadness without knowing why it is there until the plot gets around to showing us why it is there. If Antonio were worried about his ships or feeling unconscious guilt for being anti-Semitic or heaven help us jealously in love with Bassanio, as the new artistic director of our old globe condescendingly claims he must be, if, or must be played if directors are to reach contemporary audiences, the language of the play would tell us so. It doesn't. In fact, Antonio is a loving friend, willing to sacrifice all for love, rightly willing to plead for his life until he sees there is no hope, and then rightly patient in accepting death. His anguish over his losses is all for Bassanio's sake, and he says not a word against the justice of the state in granting Shylock the terms of his bond. He is, in the arena of merchandising and the law, what Bassanio is, in that of matrimony, that is, willing to give and hazard all he has for love. Antonio, as Portia says, being the bosom lover of my lord must needs be like my lord. All we need to do is to believe her. Two, Bassanio. There is nothing wrong with Bassanio. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with Bassanio. He does not change, grow, or learn in any essential way. Only the circumstances change so that what he always is may be dramatically revealed. In Venice, at first, he is a generous entertainer and master, not a miserly valuer of quantities like Shylock. At the same time, he is conscious of his debts and wishes to pay them off. His debts themselves are not the issue, for no one makes a dramatic issue of them. His desire to quit himself of them and to repay Antonio's love is the issue, as he says. His proposition to Antonio to furnish him with the means to win in one journey a fair and virtuous wife and the wealth to pay his debts is indeed thrift, that is, a way of thriving. His mind correctly presages good fortune as Antonio's sadness correctly presages loss. We would say presages, but say Shakespeare will say presages. Bassanio is not cynical, selfish, or mercenary, but adventurous, honest, hopeful, and likely to succeed. He calls himself something too prodigal, but that is modesty. And we know so because Antonio says that Bassanio always stands within the eye of honor. Antonio is willing to give my purse, my person, my extremist means for Bassanio's sake, as he would not were Bassanio in any way unworthy. Here we are told what we are meant to believe, and if we only will believe it, everything else makes sense. The wisdom Bassanio exhibits in the casket scene is not learned within the play any more than Morocco's or Aragon's folly is learned. Bassanio's words are an expression of the true lover's insight, as the words of Morocco express the blindness of pride and those of Aragon the blindness of folly. The song is not a form of cheating, 
for it may invite wisdom, but cannot substitute for it. Portia is right to love Bassanio, and her father's test is vindicated in Bassanio's victory. Nor is Bassanio to be indicted for Antonio's predicament, the results only of bad fortune coupled with Shylock's implacable will. In the trial, Bassanio says, Antonio, I am married to a wife which is as dear to me as life itself. But life itself, my wife, and all the world are not with me esteemed above thy life. I would lose all. I sacrifice them all here to this devil to deliver you. This is not merely an excuse for Portia's comic rejoinder, a joke critical only in outward show, for Portia never blames Bassanio later for his words. The speech is the true friend's answer to his friend's own willingness to be sacrificed. If the particulars of the statement seem to us hyperbolical, the feeling is certainly true. The life of the beloved friend is as esteemed as is one's own, and Bassanio here voices the selfless love in his heart, not a crass lack of care for his wife. Notice that he says he is willing to give up life as well as wife and world. The speech simply shows that the friendship works both ways. As Antonio would give all, including his life, so that Bassanio might gain Portia, so Bassanio would now give all, including Portia, so that Antonio might gain his life. Finally, when Bassanio gives the supposed Balthazar Portia's ring, he is not in fact betraying Portia, rather he seasons his actions to the time and situation. His giving up the outward symbol of their love is called for by the circumstances. Circumstances which, after all, Portia has set up precisely to see what Bassanio really values and to have fun. She herself says, and if your wife be not a mad woman, and know how well I have deserved this ring, she would not hold out enemy forever for giving it to me. And of course, no one knows better than she that she is right. Bassanio gives the ring the moment Antonio asks him to do so, and Portia herself would have him do so, for she knows he is faithful in wanting to keep the ring and also in wanting to give it up for his friend's sake. If it looks to an outsider as if he has betrayed his love, one who has insight and the capacity to value things rightly will know better. So may the outward shows be least themselves. Bassanio passes every test but those that are irrelevant because they are external to the context of the play. How are you doing? Do you need a break or are you all right? I'm coming to Shylock. About Shylock, we have a more defensible reason for being wrong. We do not want Shakespeare to have been an anti-Semite. That's the genteel modern euphemism for a hater of Jews. To avoid seeing him as such, we may take two paths. One is that of Edmund Keane, the first actor to play Shylock as a tragic man whose vengeance was a direct result of unjustified persecution. This is the 19th century emancipationist Shylock still very much with us. Reading Shylock this way makes of Shakespeare an egalitarian 250 years ahead of his time and puts him in line with modern sympathies. The other path is that of E. E. Stoll, who sees Shylock as a stock stage Jew, descendant of the Judas of the medieval drama, who comes on stage in a red wig and big nose and is cursed and hissed at until his comically villainous stratagems are foiled and he is laughed off the stage. Reading Shylock this way makes of Shakespeare an anachronism, a writer of 15th century morality plays in the late 1590s while protecting Shakespeare from the accusation of cruelty to a realistically portrayed Jew. Neither reading is true to the play. Shylock is a villain whose guilt is on his own head. There are no excuses, even in persecution, for merciless vengeance. At the same time, he is realistically human to the extent that we can empathize with his condition, though we do not approve of his behavior. We see him as a man, not a stock stage figure, and yet as a bad man. 
Is Shakespeare a hater of Jews? Only in the sense that his received theological tradition was anti-Semitic. From our modern viewpoint, the stream of anti-Semitism that has marred Christianity since the time of Jerome and Chrysostom, if not of Paul, is a historical tragedy of the first degree. But Shakespeare is not responsible for those malignant elements of the Christian doctrine and tradition that portray the Jew as the archetypal rejecter of God. And the play is not about them. Neither is it about the Jews as a people. As every editor of the play repeats, and sleight of hand new historicists try to deny, there were almost no Jews in England between 1290 when they were expelled and the mid-17th century when they were invited back. So Shakespeare had no opportunity to observe discrepancies between the stereotype and the reality. What Shakespeare inherited was not familiarity with actual Jews, but a 1,500-year religious tradition rooted in the reaction of the early Christian theologians to Judaism's rejection of the divinity of Jesus. During the Middle Ages, the synagogue was pictured in cathedral sculpture, as a blindfolded woman, signifying that the Jews were a people benighted by God for having rejected Christian salvation. Christians justified persecuting Jews by claiming to be God's means for punishing them. Jews were imagined to be guilty of every vice that Christian doctrine repudiated, especially greed, lust, pride, violence, faithlessness, and revenge. Through the Middle Ages and into Shakespeare's time, Jews were portrayed on the stage as just such archetypal villains, usually with red wigs and leering malicious faces. Shakespeare inherited this mythic tradition, and he was a Christian. But he was also a great poetic genius and dramatic genius. He made his dramas about inherited beliefs and live moral issues not with cardboard stereotypes, but with characters brought to life. Under his hands, the stereotype of the Jew became a realistic, eloquent, and convincing human being, Shylock. Shylock has all the traditional characteristics of spiritual blindness that Christians ascribe to Jews. He is selfish, materialistic, greedy, usurious, possessive, and revengeful. But given reality by Shakespeare's art, he also feels pain, disappointment, and sorrow, and he justifies his villainy with reasons, lots of them. Shakespeare's own audience, as Shakespeare well knew, though they would have empathized with Shylock's feelings, as we do, would also have seen through Shylock's reasons, recognizing them as what we now call rationalizations. They would have seen clearly that murder was not justice that neither a Jew's having eyes, hands, and feelings like a Christian, nor the elopement of a daughter could justify revenge, no matter how believable Shakespeare made Shylock's grief. Most shockingly to us, Shakespeare's audience would have seen Shylock's forced conversion as a gift of mercy to him, a last-minute redemption from hell bestowed by a forgiving Antonio and a beneficent duke. Then, Halfway between Shakespeare and us, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the Western world changed. The Enlightenment and Romanticism happened. The American and the French revolutions happened. Suddenly our ideas of what ought to be valued were changed, and the human longing for the good reformed itself, reformed itself around the principles of individual rights, equality, and liberty. These became our received ideas, as fundamental to our thinking as Christianity and its traditional concept of the Jews were fundamental to Shakespeare's. So in the early 19th century, Shylock begins to be portrayed differently. He begins to gain our sympathy. His protest against being vilified comes to seem more justified. His plotting for revenge ceases to seem so thoroughly evil. Under this pressure of modern sympathies, the Merchant of Venice is transformed from a play about love and self-sacrifice triumphing over selfish greed into a play about a poor wronged victim rising up against unjust persecution. Eventually, not only Shylock, but the play's Christians are changed for us. Where Shakespeare's audience saw in Antonio self-sacrificial love, 
Modern audiences are railroaded into seeing hypocrisy and racism. Where audiences used to find profundity in Portia's plea for Shylock to be merciful and genius in her solution of the justice problem, now they are peer pressured into finding a cheap trick and social oppression. This new attitude didn't sit right with everyone. The words of the play didn't seem to support it. In the early 20th century, some directors began to feel that we had come too far from Shakespeare's intentions and there was a backlash. But instead of going back to Shakespeare's humanized stereotypical Jew, they went even further back to the medieval stage villains of Shakespeare's youth. There was the old cardboard Jew in the red wig and malicious smile, cackling and being hissed off the stage. This portrayal had the virtue of restoring the Christians to their rightful, admirable positions in the play. The trouble was that Shylock's words couldn't be contained in such a shallow rendering. They kept bringing the cardboard, vil cardboard villain back to life. Then the Holocaust happened, in which six million Jews were murdered because they were Jews. The 2,000-year tradition of Christian persecution of the Jews gave birth to its most monstrous offspring after which directors could not possibly imagine portraying Shylock except as the poor wronged victim of racial hatred and oppression. But if you were an English playwright of 1595, wanting to dramatize the conflict between wealth and love, possessiveness and self-sacrifice, vengeance and mercy, how would you proceed? You would symbolically contrast a Jew and a Christian. Or, to put the case the other way around, if you had inherited several stories about flesh bonds, casket choosing, ring switches, and legal casuistry, and wanted to draw from them the deepest spiritual drama possible, for what 16th century reason would you decide to scrap the highly dramatic Jew versus Christian element? The message that the play sends to the Renaissance Christians is not you are better than the Jews and may continue to go on hating them. Jews are not the point. Any more than racism against Moors is the point of Portia's distaste for Morocco's skin color. The point is that to be like Shylock in misvaluing the things of the spirit is to be spiritual kin to the rejecters of Christ, to be benighted in one's own life as the synagogue was thought to be benighted historically. As Jessica is daughter to Shylock in blood, but not in spirit, so anyone in the Christian audience might be in danger of being a Shylock in spirit, however Christian in blood. If there is anti-Semitism in this configuration of characters, and there is, it lies in the historical and religious assumptions upon which the play is built, not in the real values that the drama itself promotes, which good Jews and good Christians, in fact, share. Shakespeare has significantly humanized the stock Jew of medieval drama, not to win our approval of the Jew, but to make his villainy convincing. If we can empathize with Shylock, feel his evil as he feels it, we can better learn to renounce it in ourselves. And that villainy is the embracing of possessiveness, self-will, and vengeance to the exclusion of friendship, generosity, and forgiveness. Nor does Shylock become bad in the play. He is bad from the start. Though the form in which Shylock imagines getting revenge worsens with circumstances, his desire for revenge is already in place in his first speech. I will feed fat the ancient grudge I bear him. Cursed be my tribe if I forgive him. That's Act 1, Scene 3. He grows incensed by the loss of his daughter and his ducats, but this is an extension of his villainy, not the initiation of it. Rather than suffer anything for the benefit of another, even his daughter, he will cause others to suffer for his own benefit. As with interest rates, so with justice, Shylock is entirely self-regarding. He would have justice only so long as it serves his own will. When justice turns against him, he will have none of it. This is the point of Portia's saying, for as thou urgest justice be assured, thou shalt have justice more than thou desirest. 
She is not demonstrating that the Christians are as petty, legalistic, and implacable as Shylock. Rather, she is dramatizing that Shylock's call for the penalty and the bond was not a call for justice at all, but for revenge. And that impartial justice is a true value of which Shylock, in fact, knows nothing and wants no part. Portia's judgment exists to convince Shylock of what, without it, he would not believe. That in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. The letter of the law cuts both ways, and she must demonstrate that it does so in order to teach Shylock that without love, no man is safe from justice. But it is not only justice that we'll teach him. The judgments on the implacable materialist who rejects mercy as a principle so long as he believes justice will get him what he wants do not stand untempered. As suddenly and as unexpectedly as the strict justice of the flesh blood quibble condemns Shylock, mercy seasons it and redeems him. Unlike Shylock, the Christians, Portia, Antonio, and the Duke, who might in justice take Graziano's attitude, a halter, gratis, meaning a noose, instead dispense mercy. Thus Shylock is forced, since he will not do it on his own, to become generous, to make his material wealth into something spiritually useful, and at last, to be saved. It is a commonplace observation that to a Renaissance Christian audience, Shylock's forced conversion would seem a merciful gift, not an act of injustice or persecution. Notice that Shakespeare does not give us a Shylock who is so devoted to his faith and people that he would rather die than be converted, as many Jews have in reality had to do. To Shakespeare, Shylock's Judaism is not, as another's faith might seem to us, a different but perhaps equally valid religion. Shylock's reception of mercy is the first instance of, in him of any religion whatsoever. His final acceptance of life, conversion, and the use of half of his wealth is a sign that having tempered justice, mercy has triumphed even in one who neither offered nor looked for it. Shylock's half not a Jew eye speech is the one place where we are most tempted to hear a call for justice for the Jews as a people. But what is the actual dramatic point of the speech? Of course, from Shylock's point of view, the claims seem reasonable. A villain will blame his wrongdoing on the wrongs that have been done him. And yes, Jews do have eyes, hands, dimensions, etc. See? Shakespeare is extremely astute to have Shylock use his participation in universal humanity as a defense. But again, the issue is not the persecution of the Jews, but true valuation. What is Shylock using his defense to defend? Why, revenge. Perhaps I should read the speech. Salerio, why, I am sure if he forfeit, thou wilt not take his flesh. What's that good for? Shylock, to bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands? Organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why, revenge. 
The villainy you teach me I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. It shall go hard, but I will better means it will go hard if I do not better the instruction. So what is Shylock using this defense to defend? Why, revenge. And what are the human parts that he calls upon to witness to his participation in universal humanity? All those, and only those parts, that all men, including madmen and villains, have in common. In fact, no parts that distinguish men from beasts, except laughter, of which Shylock himself knows nothing. Once again, even in his moment of highest self-righteousness, Shylock can think only in material terms. According to him, men are bodies and passions. They are capable of bleeding, laughter, death, and vengeance. His daughter is his flesh and blood only. Nowhere in his defense does he appeal to the higher things that good men have in common. Reason, love, the desire for justice, the capacity for mercy, humility before God. His whole speech is a reduction of what he shares with other men to the lowest common elements. Reasonable human behavior is limited in his mind to an eye for an eye. The answer to him is not, yes, we have mistreated you, so your mistreatment of us is just. The answer is, as Shakespeare shows, though you would better our instruction in villainy, we will better yours in justice. You want an eye for an eye, we will give you justice tempered with mercy. You would hurt us for hurting you. We will, though you hurt us, do you good beyond your capacity to imagine it. Yes, this Jew hath eyes, but they see men as merely pounds of flesh. Shylock's only hope lies in being defeated at the hands of justice and in his accepting the redemption that mercy forces on him against his benighted will. His final words in the play are the only truly hopeful words he speaks. I am content. Four, Jessica. We need look no further than Jessica to see that racial or ethnic prejudice is not the issue because the moment her spiritual orientation is recognized, she is embraced by the Christian world, including Lorenzo, Bassanio, Antonio, and Portia. Jessica tells us all we need to know about her leaving Shylock. Alack, what heinous sin is it in me to be ashamed to be my father's child? But though I am a daughter to his blood, I am not to his manners. O oh, Lorenzo, if thou keep promise, I shall end this strife, become a Christian, and thy loving wife. Her fear of heinous sin is the natural and proper hesitation any daughter should feel in being ashamed to be her father's child. It is parallel to Lancelot's fear of obeying the fiend by changing masters. But Shylock being what he is, it is no sin to leave him and become a Christian. Again, there is no talk of betraying one's faith or people, which there would be if Shakespeare cared to make apostasy an issue. The issue is leaving a house that is hell for a life of love and a path to heaven. And that is what becoming a Christian really does mean to the Elizabethan audience. The singing and dancing and masks Shylock wants to shut out are symbols of joy which Jessica rightly feels is more valuable than the miserliness and isolation she knows at home. Lorenzo says of Jessica, like herself, wise, fair, and true, shall she be placed in my constant soul. These words, aspiring to the marriage of true minds of Sonnet 116, Lorenzo speaks both honestly and correctly as we are meant to see in the harmonious affection between him and Jessica in Act 5. There, the banter about false lovers, just like the banter about the rings later, is love play. Lorenzo and Jessica, like Portia and Bassanio, or Nerissa and Graziano, jestingly accuse one another of infidelity and slander precisely because none of them is guilty of any such thing. 
Their jesting bespeaks a happiness in their fidelity that unfaithful lovers could never enjoy, the point of the contrast. Furthermore, Jessica's fidelity to Lorenzo has brought to Shylock more mercy than would have come to him if she had not stolen from his house. In regard to Shylock, Lorenzo has said, if e'er the Jew her father come to heaven, it will be for his gentle daughter's sake. This prediction comes true in part, for it is Lorenzo and Jessica that Antonio has in mind at the trial's end when he asks that Shylock leave half his wealth to them and become a Christian. Finally, Jessica's disguise is not a sin, but a symbol. Portia's picture is encased in the lead casket as love is encased in the will to give and hazard all. Portia is dressed in the robes of a doctor of laws as mercy in the robes of justice. Antonio's right is hidden in Shylock's bond as blood in the flesh and the spirit of the law in the letter. The soul is dressed in the body. And like all these disguises, the loving Jessica is disguised as the daughter of the Jew. But since, as she says, she is daughter to his blood, but not to his manners, to disguise herself in order to escape Shylock is not to falsify herself, but to become her true self. As the Jason Bassanio has found the golden fleece in the leaden casket, so the Jason Lorenzo has found his in an equally unlikely place, the house of a Jew. Jessica, dressed as a boy, becomes his torchbearer indeed, lighting their way to joy. Lastly, Portia. In what has already been said, we have nearly finished justifying Portia as well. A few points remain to be made. The Elizabethan attitude toward dark-skinned people, like Christian anti-Semitism, is another of history's tragedies. But again, Shakespeare's purpose in his own and Portia's characterization of Morocco is not to give vent to racial prejudice. Here, as in Othello, as we'll see, the relation between skin color and character is complex and is developed for specific dramatic purposes. Black, according to Renaissance belief, is the color of the devil. And Portia's two comments about Morocco's color use the word complexion, which signified not only the hue of one's skin, but also the complex of elements and humors, and therefore the character, implied by it. Before Portia sees Morocco, she says, if he have the condition of a saint and the complexion of a devil, I had rather he should shrive me than wive me expressing both her aesthetic preference and her recognition that the outward shows may be least themselves. But she says she will marry him if he chooses right. Once he has chosen wrong, she hopes that all of his complexion choose so, that is, that all of both his skin color and his moral makeup choose the wrong casket. Nor can we blame Portia, having seen Morocco's shortcomings for ourselves. Like Othello when his fatal choices have been made, Morocco confirms that his character and his color, in Elizabethan terms, correspond where they might, to his credit, have contrasted. Indeed, the fun Portia makes of her suitors is the fun that ought to be made of them, for all but Bassanio, including the Englishman, presumably a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, are in one way or another proud, foolish, and cowardly. The terms of the casket test include the provision that any suitor swear never to marry if he should choose wrongly. Most of the suitors leave unwilling to accept these terms, thus exhibiting their own unworthiness. About the casket test, Nerissa says, your father was ever virtuous, and holy men at their death have good inspirations. Therefore, the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold, silver, and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly, but one who you shall rightly love. That she is right is borne out by events. 
The casket test proves itself not only by winning for Portia precisely the man she loves and ought to love, and the man who truly loves her, but by preserving Portia and at least two other potential wives from marrying fools. Even from the grave, Portia's wise father shows mercy to other men's daughters as well as to his own, in distinct contrast with Shylock, for whom the relation between death, daughters, and caskets is, would she were hearsed at my foot and the ducats in her coffin. In acquiescing to the will of a dead father, Portia finds that she has won both a desired and a deserved husband. Giving and hazarding all, both Portia and Bassanio rightly love, therefore rightly choose, therefore rightly win. The song sung while Bassanio is choosing among the caskets is not a form of cheating, but simply what Portia says it is. If he loses, a swan song. If he wins, a flourish. The song cannot help anyone who has not the wit to see its point. And if Shakespeare meant us to see it as cheating, someone somewhere would have said so. Portia's legal judgment in the court scene is unexceptionable even as her speech on mercy is sublime. She concludes the speech with a statement that has been read as a trap for Shylock. I have spoke thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if thou follow, the strict court of Venice must needs give sentence against the merchant there. But the words are not meant to tempt Shylock to ignore mercy. Rather, they are meant to put Shylock's choice dramatically before him and us. Justice or mercy, the letter of the law or its spirit. Nor is this the last time Portia offers him the chance to be merciful. The point of the flesh-blood quibble is not that the Christians are as petty as Shylock. It is that implacable justice and nothing but justice will in the end hurt the accuser even more than the accused. The golden rule is literally essential to everyone's life. As for Portia's ring test, it is delightful fun, but it is also a comic version of the serious testing of Shylock in the court scene and of Bassanio in Belmont. Will the person being tested trust to the outward show, the glittering casket, the letter of the bond, the possession of the ring? Or will he rather trust to the greater reality of which these are merely external disguises? Shylock fails his test. Bassanio passes both of his. He surrenders the ring, the outward symbol, in order to serve more truly the cause of love. As again, Shylock would not have surrendered his turquoise. Bassanio's love for Portia is not in the least tainted by his giving away the ring for love of Antonio, and Portia knows it well. Thus, with caskets, court trial, and rings, Portia is constantly challenging men and the audience to learn how to value things rightly by seasoning their judgment. I'm going to read a passage from Act 5. Portia says to Nerissa, they're returning from Venice. They haven't got to the house yet. They're just coming back to Belmont. Portia, that light we see is burning in my hall. How far that little candle throws his beams. So shines a good deed in a naughty world. Nerissa, when the moon shone, we did not see the candle. Portia, so doth the greater glory dim the less. A substitute shines brightly as a king until a king be by, and then his state empties itself as doth an inland brook into the main of waters. Music, hark. Nerissa, it is your music, madam, of the house. Portia, nothing is good, I see, without respect. Methinks it sounds much sweeter than by day. How many things by season seasoned are to their right praise and true perfection. Portia here sums up the point of the play. Valuing each thing with respect, seasoning our judgments, we become capable of right praise and are ourselves seasoned 
to true perfection. Shylock, remembered in the harmony of Act V as a man in whom there is no music and who is fit for treason, stratagems, and spoils, is consistently guilty of blindness to true value, just as the personified synagogue was pictured blindfolded in the presence of the personified church. His speech is repetitive and mechanical. He is a man for whom murderous hatred of a fellow human being is indistinguishable from another man's hatred of a rat, a gaping pig, a cat, a bagpipe. He trusts to the letter of the law, which means, as we have seen, to his own will. Thus, barring a redemption unimaginable to him, he is appointed to loneliness and destruction. Portia, by contrast, treats the ring as no more valuable than is fitting. Not being a madwoman, she forgives Bassanio for giving it to me. She does not wish he were dead at her feet and the ring on his finger, but loves him the more for having given it away for good reason. There is no exclusion in love. Loving a wife and loving a friend are equally valid and valuable. And in well-tuned minds, one love is not jealous of another, especially when mere gold and silver, caskets and rings are at issue. Jessica could be happy loving both Shylock and Lorenzo if only Shylock would let her. And Portia wants Bassanio to love Antonio truly, for it means that he can also love her truly. She knows that in loving and being true to Antonio, Bassanio is loving and being true to her as well. Antonio and Bassanio are one. Bassanio and Portia are one. So Antonio and Portia are one. This is the unity of love, which in Shylock's arithmetic is unimaginable. In being thankful to the doctor of laws for saving Antonio's life, Bassanio is being true to Portia, who is the doctor of laws, not only by virtue of her disguise, but by virtue of her actual doctoring in the courtroom of Venice, and who is also symbolically a doctor of the law of love, which supersedes the law of contracts and bonds, as the New Testament was believed to have superseded the old. The physical ring makes a circuit from Portia to Bassanio, from Bassanio via Antonio, who requests that it be given, and Graziano, who carries it, to the supposed Balthazar, from the supposed Balthazar to Portia, the shortest of distances, and from Portia again to Bassanio. But the circuit that the ring makes in being given and given again is a far greater ring than the physical ring itself. In giving up the mere golden ring, Bassanio completes the ring of love. Portia gives Antonio life with the court judgment and living with the letter about his safely harbored ships. Thus the play ends with the true dispensation of the wealth that has served as the medium of exchange throughout. For Shylock, that material wealth has been all, measurable against love and life itself until it is weighed against his own life. For the others, it is the means of enjoying both life and love precisely because it is valued only with respect, that is, willingly hazarded for that which is more valuable. In Venice, Shylock closes up his house's ears against the entry of music from the world, just as he had been enclosed in his own selfish will. In Belmont, the music of Portia's house spreads out into the world as Portia herself goes out to Venice to redeem Antonio from Shylock and Shylock from himself. Shylock's house is a hell, Portia's is a heaven, and the play that shows us so is itself a heavenly harmony. Thank you. The play this, that was done last summer uh, at the Old Globe. Yes. They left out some of the comic scenes. Yes. Why, why would they want to do that? Um, well, there are a lot of reasons that a director or a theater might do that. One is they might just not have the numbers of people that they want. Another is 
They want to shorten the time. Usually they don't want it to go over two hours, and Shakespeare can run three easily. Um, but another is very often that they don't see its relevance. And uh, they think it's just comic relief or you know, distraction or keeping the groundlings happy. Um, and Sha for Shakespeare, there's always keeping the groundlings happy. And there is some degree of comic relief, but it's almost never wise to assume that there isn't also thematic significance in the comic scenes, in the subplots, and the, the, the jokes. So if, if you are reading it poetically, as he means it to be heard and read, you will see the thematic connections, and, um, and they shed light on the main themes and the main plot, just as foil characters you know, reveal other characters. So there are, there are technical, practical reasons why they might cut some things out. Um, but uh, when they put them in, the question is whether they're getting how they fit or whether they think they don't fit. So, so to be more specific, um, I can't remember the, the, the Shylock's buffoon sort of playing with his father's blindness. Yes, Lancelot and That's the sand yeah, blind. That's right. Um, so that's in part all about this idea of the, the, um, the shows may be least themselves. He doesn't, does he, if, first of all, there's a cliche. It's a wise man who knows his own father, right? Or his own son, for that matter. So the father is sand blind and he doesn't recognize Lancelot. And he's asking Lancelot where he can find Lancelot. Well, think of the casket test. You know, where is Portia? She's in one of those three caskets. And you cannot see with your eyes in which she is. So you have to see with some other part of yourself. And that um, um, missing of the mark is the comical version of that. In the end of that scene, uh, the father agrees to bring gifts, which he was going to give to Shylock to help him deal better with his son Lancelot. He agrees to take them instead to Bassanio. So Bassanio becomes, uh, in that, a receiver of gifts as well as a giver. And so thematically, it, it connects up. And it's, it, you know, it's slapstick. So it's not as comedy necessarily profound. But if you check the language carefully, you will see that thematically it's related. Um, and they just, they either thought the audience, it, either they needed to shorten it, or the audience isn't going to get it, or we don't have someone to perform it, that will do it properly, or whatever. I, don't, I mean, I don't know what his reasons are. <clears throat> I do know his reasons for making Antonio um, seem to be in unrequited love of Bassanio, because he came up to the Jewish Community Center and spoke about it and talked about why he thinks you have to play it that way. Um, I think it's insulting to the audience, but he thinks it's the only way you can play it now and make it believable because nobody believes in you know, ideal Renaissance friendship, a selfless love of a friend. And of course, my answer to that is, well, that's because people like you have been burying it for the last <laughs> 200 years. And if you would just bring it out again, people might begin to get an idea of what friendship looks like. But you know, talk, talk to the... Uh, Talk to the wind about that. I'm talking to you. He, he doesn't want to listen. Was he saying that you that only now you can't play it that, or was he saying really all throughout? No, he was saying in, back in Shakespeare's time, maybe that made sense, but it doesn't make any sense now. It doesn't read, and why wouldn't you do it now? You know, why wouldn't you make Antonio in love with Bassanio? It's so topical. Well, yeah, it's topical. And it does appeal to the audience at a superficial TV level, but it breaches the whole thematic underlying significance of that friendship. And therefore, it, it, in a way, in my opinion, poisons the well. The same way it poisons the well to make the Christians bad guys um, responsible for Shylock's villainy, as if he's being bad because he's persecuted. You know, that's a modern idea. You can play it that way, but it's not getting to the profundity that Shakespeare's really trying to get across. You're, in fact, screening us 
from that profundity by doing it that way because all we then see reflected is ourselves. You know, the, the director of that kind puts up a big mirror on the stage and we look at ourselves. And we don't look at ourselves in any deep way, we look at ourselves the way we see ourselves on television. It's just the cliches of the moment. My argument would be, get that damn mirror off the stage and look through Shakespeare's eyes at what he's really <coughs> saying in his own terms, and then a whole world of reality that I think is universal opens up, where love really must temper justice or we're all in trouble. And I think it matters to do that. But um, I think he feels, directors like him anyway, I'm not sure he does, feels that it's too much of a risk. You'll lose your audience. Um, and I think that's kind of condescending to the audience, but he's the one that's got to sell tickets. I don't. So. so, And he's the artistic director. He can do what he wants. And then we can either go or not and pay our ticket. I'm making you guys sound like the enemy, but you're not. But I've been <laughs> arguing about this for 40 years. How many? 40? Eh, 45, probably. Uh, trying to defend Shakespeare, the real Shakespeare, against these ideas. This um, lecture that I've given you is a kind of modified version of a chapter in a book that I have written called Shakespeare's Problem Audience. And I, I took what were called the problem plays which are not this play, but um, Measure for Measure, All's Well That Ends Well, Troilus and Cressida, and Hamlet. They're classically, or at least for the last couple hundred years, called problem plays because we find them unresolved and disturbing and bizarre and so on. And I wrote a book to show that they're not bizarre or disturbing at all. They're great if you ask uh, Shakespeare's questions of them and not modern questions of them. If you ask modern questions of them, they turn into big problems that can't be solved. So the book is called Shakespeare's Problem Audience because the problems with the so-called problem plays are really our problems, not the play's problems. Um, and uh, at least two more of the lectures I'm going to give will be sort of modified from that book. Um, the one in Othello is not in there because it's not usually classified as a problem play, although people make it a problem. All right, questions, more questions. Yes? I mean, one of the problems that I have with it is how Christians come off looking. I mean, the way Antonio treats, um, treats Shylock is yeah. not with Christian kindness necessarily. I mean, how, yeah, how do you reconcile it? Well, first of all, um, we don't see Shylock, I mean, we don't see Antonio spitting on Shylock, in fact. We hear, we hear Shylock, Shylock claiming that he did, and Antonio, in a sense, hyperbolically says, I'm likely to do so again because of what, <coughs> excuse me, what you are. So you have to remember <coughs> that this is a myth come to life for the Christian audience. It would be like this. Um, let's say that we wrote a play in which some unregenerate Nazi who's escaped Germany at the end of the war and been living in Alabama, um, you know, uh, reveals himself to be a kind of skinhead supporter and all this. And we, we have a character who is so outraged by this, you know, a long-haired, let's call him some kind of Hollywood actor of, of the uh, inveterate left wing, spits on him because the guy is promoting these twisted values. And the, and the Nazi says, you see, you see, you're spitting on me. This is your fault that I'm a Nazi. I should be against you guys. And we would go, you're crazy, you know? So all I'm asking you to do is if you just invert it to who it is. We are sensitive to this because Jews are sensitive to this, and we should be. And we don't want 
people putting on this play in order to justify anti-Semitism. So I don't think the play should be produced generally because it cannot be produced properly without in the wrong people fostering anti-Semitism. And, and if it's produced improperly, it's, it's not giving us what Shakespeare means. So I think it's dangerous to do this play. Uh, and I don't, I don't have a solution for it. I mean, my, my solution has been, you have these four ways of playing it and none of them is good. Um, but bec because of what's I mean, happened. I have less of a problem you know, for imagining that the audience would demonize or think of Shylock as a villain, but I have more trouble grappling it with how they would see a Christian saying, you know, yes, I would spit on it. Yeah, I mean, I you're absolutely problem. right. How the audience would see that now is, is in a way unacceptable. It kind of reinforces or prejudice. Even, or it's even not, then. Yeah. No, then it's a different thing. That's what I'm trying to get at. Now it has that effect because of egalitarianism and democracy and Freud and the Holocaust. But then it would not have had that meaning. Um, it couldn't have. Because who he's spitting on is this rejecter of Christ. You know, this cruel, vicious, vengeful villain. And Antonio's not spitting on him because he's a Jew. He's spitting on him because what being a Jew means <coughs> is being evil. The way you would spit on Iago, you know, at a certain point in the play. Uh, Othello goes, runs at Iago and tries to stab him. If thou beest a devil, I cannot kill thee, he says. And he can't because he is a devil, but we wouldn't mind spitting on him. So it's, it's, that's why I'm saying this context of the time is so important. Now, if you get hung up on that, then you lose the sense of what the play is really about. And if you can get past that, then you realize that the play is promoting what Jews and Christians agree to be good values. Yeah? To sort of change the subject a little bit, how do you, um explain back in that day the fact that he made Portia the cleverest, smartest character in the play. Because so he knew what women are. Okay. <laughs> Duh. Duh. <laughs> uh, Philip Thompson says um, that Jane Austen creates a character in the person of Elizabeth Bennet who embodies a divine goddess with all kinds of great qualities, which I can't quote by heart, but justice, kindness, virtue, energy, wit, you know, responsiveness, and so he goes on and on. And then he says, this goddess is the inspiration of Shakespearean comedy, and in uh, Ford Maddox Ford's parades, then she appears as Valentine one-up, and that's the entire extent of her literary career. So there's this kind of woman that appears in Shakespeare, appears in Jane Austen, appears in Ford Maddox Ford, and nowhere else, at least according to him. Um, and it's a kind of ideal as well. However, there's also a blindness to what women are in our time that's parallel, and we'll talk about this a little more next week with Measure for Measure, to the blindness about um, Jews and blacks and so on. And that is the idea that women are uh, uh, simply oppressed men. Women are men who have been oppressed. You take away the oppression, then women and men are the same, and we're done. And uh, if I embrace that idea, my greatest teacher would turn over in her grave <laughs> because she believed that that was nonsense, that um, women and men are much better reflected in the um, Chinese idea of yin and yang, and that only through the union of opposites is anything created, and that the essential quality of woman is wisdom, um, and that unless women recognize that, uh, the society in which they live is, in a sense, doomed. So women have this triple aspect, she says, 
that is um, figured in images of the young, attractive lover and the matronly mother and provider and the worshiping prophetess or uh, Sophia figure of wisdom. And she said wis women have this capacity to worship that keeps men from going off the deep end and keeps the society also. Um, and she was so frustrated with the feminist movement because it obscured and, and ignored and really denied that three aspect. So who is Portia? Portia is the embodiment in a way of a kind of vitality of wisdom enacting, uh, being enacted in the world. She, in a sense, descends from Belmont into the world of Venice, which is the, the mercantile world, to redeem, to bring wisdom. And the wisdom lies in this tempering and judging each thing with respect. That's where wisdom lies. So that um, she, she embodies in the practical world uh, a truer vision of the nature of man and of reality. And, and where does Shakespeare get it? He's a genius. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I've not known that woman. I've known a profound and magnificent woman. Maybe when she was young, she was like a Portia. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, you know, I mean, think, who do you know that's that? But then who do you know that's Antonio, willing to just die for your good? Your friend, willing to just lay down his life and die for you? We don't see that very often either. Is that a cause or an effect? I'm sorry? Is that a cause or an effect? If 200 years of, of de denigrating those kinds of things, you're not going to get very much of them. That's absolutely true. That's, absolutely, that's why culture is so important. And it's why I keep teaching. <laughs> Even though, you know, the tide is against me. <laughs> because I believe, and I'll tell you a secret, this... this um, may or may not be cut out of the YouTube version. <laughs> Every year I get asked the same question by my English department colleagues. Why do you think we should teach British literature in the sophomore year? And every year I answer a little more angrily than the previous year. And I always say the same thing. Because number one, it's the best. Because if they can read this, they can read anything. Because it's, it's a, a precious inheritance etc. I give about five more reasons. And, um, and then they look at me and they go, but it's so narrow. <laughs> <laughs> so what can I tell you? We, we don't get it uh, in our culture. And I'm fighting that tide. I'm just saying, no, that's wrong. There's something there that we're not going to get anywhere else. And kids need it. Kids need to do uh, experience an ideal before they start becoming cynical. And we adult cynical adults, English teachers, are so excited to share our enthusiasms with the kids, our cynical enthusiasms, that we want to give them, you know, James Joyce and On the Road and, and um, I don't know, The Beloved, beloved or some <laughs> these hideous darknesses waiting for Gatto before they ever have read about Portia, let's say, or the equivalent, Pride and Prejudice, or David Copperfield, or whatever. So yes, I'm, I'm standing against the tide, and that's what I do for a living. I stand against the tide. Uh, one of these days, it'll wash me away, but that's all right. Hopefully not. All the best battles are losing battles, <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is a little bit off topic from the play, but it was sparked by something you said earlier. You, you made mention of, of the directors are basically holding a mirror up to ourselves so we can't get past anything. Thinking that they're selling tickets yeah, that yeah. way. But I, I see that in, in juvenile literature. Judy Bloom and all. These kids in school are reading about people like themselves. That, I mean... What good is that? They don't, there's no breath to what they read or, or learn. Or they're, they they're reading about worse versions of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, when, I was, when most of us were kids, we read about mythology and science fiction and, you know, 
uh, Adam of the Road and stuff like that that were that were people who were I interesting and different from us. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that's. You're naming the problem. I am just to make you feel better. There's a novel out by a professor who teaches English at, uh, or I think he teaches history at Hillsdale College. And he wrote a little novel, a kind of young adult novel, called The Perfect Game, about a kid playing baseball. And it's a wonderful book. And it's not what you're saying. It's the opposite. It's a, it's a, kid, it's a kid like a kid you know, that might read it, but he's, he's good. And he is heroic. And when it comes to the crunch, he does the right thing and that kind of thing. It's a wonderful book, and I've been recommending it. Isn't that one of the things that we have to find the universalities and, and by meeting people who are different than we are? Yeah. But, but we have to find something that's the same in ourselves. We can't just go around meeting different people. No, no, you're absolutely right. The point, I, I guess what I'm saying is um, we are not sharing with our youth now much images of virtue, of heroism, of, of success, of triumph, of, of real values. We are, we are showing images of adjustment to compromising values. Right. I and mean, it, it's the same idea like you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but I, the bathwater needs to be thrown out. That's right. That's true. So that takes wisdom and discernment. Nothing is good I see without respect, says Portia. And that's Exactly right. The, the, I mean, there is isn't universality if we're not, at some level, similar. And so we have to value everybody, and multiculturalism grows out of that value. It is not a product of, you know, a totally perverse imagination. It's the product of a pretty good principle. The problem is when that um, gets bloated out of proportion by ignoring all other principles. So, you know, um, liberty is a very good thing, but it's, it's, it's not the only thing. And if you, if you indulge liberty at the expense of, let's say, chastity, uh, the society is going to go down. Does that mean you should have all chastity and no liberty? Of course not. But it also, doesn't, it also means you don't have all liberty and no chastity. Because it, that doesn't work either. So the values, the, the great and true values go together and they reinforce each other and they must be weighed together with respect, as Porsche said. Uh, otherwise, you go off the deep end with, a, a, perfect, with a, a value that's perfectly good when it's surrounded by the others that becomes a monstrosity when it's taken apart from all the others. I, nothing I said means that women shouldn't vote, okay? <laughs> or be paid equal pay for equal work. I'm not saying that. But I am saying don't be dumb. Actually, I was reading a... I, I have to say, I, actually, I am a feminist, but I was reading a feminist commentary on how poor Portia can't get anything done until she dresses up like a man and has oh, this. Please. And it's like, <laughs> wait, stop, 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 stop. Yeah. So it was, I mean, because this is one of those plays where it's a man dressed up as a woman pretending to be a man. Correct. So there are these, you know, And why was that? Why weren't women allowed on the stage? Okay, so we are told it's because men are oppressive and they're oppressing women. Why shouldn't they be free to be an actor, you know? We have Shakespeare in Love, where the, the, the girl has to pretend to be a boy in order to get, become an actor. It's because every high civilization that has had any tragic drama has not allowed women on the stage out of profound respect and worship of the mystery that is woman. Not to be paraded on a stage and denigrated and reduced to a mere entertainment or a player. The Japanese would not allow women on stages. The Greeks did not until very late, and uh, neither the Elizabethans. Um, only in the, in the 17th century were women allowed on the stage in restoration drama. And you know what restoration drama is about. It's all about illicit sex and jokes about the same. And, and that's when women are allowed on the stage. Well, not so great for the women. So um, it, it's, again, this 
the, the blindness to the aspect of woman which is holy and w wise and mysterious and therefore civilizing to man, uh, when that is obscured from us, we are left with nothing but other versions of men. Do you think Antonio was, he started the play with him depressed? Wasn't he depressed that his economy, his business venture was going a bust? And that's he, didn't he, know that it, he didn't know that it was bust at that point in the play, no. He has all these ships out trading. Venice, remember, is a huge trading center. Uh, and the laws of Venice preserve the just trading between nations from all over. And so he's got a lot of ships out buying and selling everywhere. And he's a rich man. And it, he doesn't think that things are in trouble yet. They, go, they get in trouble later, but not then. Um, and when he says, I, in sooth, I know not why I'm so sad, that's not the same as depressed. Sad means serious, sober, um, slightly unhappy, but he doesn't know why. And my point is, he, it's intentional that he doesn't know why, and we don't know why. And because Shakespeare is giving us just a very plain premonition. He's having a premonition that things will go bad, but he doesn't know it. And that is just a, a dramatic foreshadowing um, of, a, of a very typical kind in Shakespeare. So no, it doesn't, we're not supposed to find the secret cause of that sadness. There isn't one. It's just a premonition. And it comes true. He has good reason to be sad, though he doesn't know it then, because he's nearly going to die in the course of the play. And his ships will be lost, he thinks. And so there's reason to be sad. But he can't know that ahead of time. And we're not meant to either. Until later, when we see the threat to him, and then we realize why he was sad at the beginning. Because he had a premonition. <coughs> Why is Hamlet considered a problem play? I thought problem plays were ones that weren't necessarily within the category. So, you know, like a comedy that isn't really a comedy, like, uh, you know, that merely is a comedy because it ends in a wedding. Well, they but call Measure for Measure and All's Well dark comedies. Yeah. They're not dark at all. They're, they're serious. Um, they call uh, Troilus and Cressida a problem play because they don't know what category it fits into. Right, but Hamlet's a and the reason that, that is is that it fits into the category of satire, and Shakespeare only wrote one of them, um, and so they don't have others to compare it to. Um, but, but the Hamlet. reason they call Hamlet a problem is that for 250 years they have resolutely rejected what Hamlet says Hamlet is about and tried to substitute alternative explanations and since none, no alternative explanation makes sense of the play, they feel that it is co incoherent and inchoate and disjointed. And what is the mystery of Hamlet? And they're constantly trying to figure it out. And when you point out to them it's that Shakespeare tells us precisely what it is, they say, oh, no, it can't be that. Shakespeare <laughs> wasn't so dumb as to be a Christian or to believe in God and uh, so on. So I will explain this on our fourth lecture in detail. I always, I always envision Hamlet as a straight up tragedy. You know, it's a tragedy. He's got a fatal flaw. He, you know, it's well, but what's the fatal the flaw? Day. The problem is, what is the fatal flaw? Uh, uh, Olivier's film <clears throat> begins with a voiceover in which he says, this is a play about a man who, can't who could not make mind. up his yeah. mind. All right. So that tells you. And then, and then he goes through this play. I mean, he's a brilliant actor, but the play is all based on um, uh, Freudian ideas. Um, what is his name, the biographer of Freud? Please, somebody help me. Uh, Harold Bloom? No, no, before that. The early biographer of Freud. Ah, starts with an E. Anyway, never mind. He had this theory about Hamlet, and so Olivier makes it all about this Freudian... <laughs> Thing. He doesn't even make it about not making up his mind. It's it's just bizarre. It's just edible sort of, yeah. which, which Burton does, and you know a lot of. So that's just not it. Shakespeare's not a Freudian, but I, I'll tell you in a few weeks about Hamlet.